Is your small business growing? That's the question we address right here on the Grow Your Biz Show. It's where we interview strategic entrepreneurs who inform and inspire you on your solopreneur or small company journey. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Grow Your Biz Show. Hello and welcome to episode number 119 of the Grow Your Biz Show. Hi, I'm your host, Paul Madsen, and here with another big show, and this is a big show, maybe bigger than ever, and I'm so excited because with us today, we have none other than Jeffrey Hazlett. He, Jeff is the uh, chairman of the uh, C-Suite Network, and he's going to tell you all about that, and it's a it's a big thing, and so we're very excited. Uh, and uh, Jeff, come on, come on down. Yay! What? Hey, Jeff, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Well, thanks for taking the time. I know you got a lot going on. We were just talking earlier. You've you've had about four shows today. I've done, yeah, I've done a number of interviews. I've done four interviews plus done two other shows. So it's been a long day. Yeah, well, you're going to sleep all the night. Uh, well, I know uh, you're used to flying all over the country, which takes a different kind of stamina. But uh, hey, it's a different world with uh, the virus and all that, right? Exactly right. Which you have to, it's about change, adapt, or die. And of course, I don't mean to take that lightly in terms of what we're seeing with COVID-19, but it's all about making sure that you do what you got to do when you got to do it. That's the way business goes. Well, and uh, I talked with all my guests lately, the, the P word, and I don't mean please, I mean pivot, of course. And so, hey, Jeff, we're going to kick off uh, my show with a tradi- my traditional uh, trademark, I guess, uh, question. And I, I'm going to ask you to, to tell our audience, Jeff, what, what business are you in? Well, we help C-suite executives be the most strategic people in the room through education, motivation, a little inspiration, and help them, you know, truly excel the growth of their business. That's what we're all about. Wow, that, that's, a, that's a lot of posturing there. The most prestigious person in the room, I love it because uh, we, we have about six seconds to make the first impression, don't we? Yeah, well, not prestigious. I said strategic. The most important thing is to be strategic. You know, a lot of us would like to think as business leaders that we're the most uh, smartest person in the room, but we're not. Right. Uh, Clearly, if you talk to any C-suite executive, they'll tell you they're not the smartest, but they hire a lot of smart people. But our job is to truly be the most strategic person in the room. And that might lead to prestigious. Well, yeah. But to be strategic. It's not the goal, though, is it? It's not necessarily the goal. Uh, So Never the goal. Yeah, strategic strategy is everything in this in this day and age. Uh, well, tell, tell the viewers uh, just what the C-Suite Network really is, Jeffrey. Well, we have over 350,000 members from across North America and some other countries as well. We get together through our community, through our media, which we have C-Suite TV, C-Suite Radio, our C-Suite Book Club, C-Suite Academy. And then we also have lots of meetings, hundreds of meetings. Of course, a lot of those meetings used to be face-to-face, but now we've adapted to a more digital version of that. And uh, we still have hundreds of meetings of people getting together in a community. And then we have our concierge services of, uh, you know, being able to provide you with the right tools, education services, sometimes advisors and coaches. And, and that's what we do is we put all those together under one big umbrella, like kind of like a giant sequoia tree. Yeah. And if you've ever been in that, you know, redwood forest, you see those giant sequoias and underneath there's this huge canopy and underneath it's this lush ecosystem that right. there explains what the C-suite network is all about. Lots of living organisms underneath that tree and lots of dependent on each other and interdependent of each oh. other. And uh, yet they all get along and, and benefit from each other. It sounds like. Well, well not, they don't always, they don't always get along, but we do oh, our best. Sometimes they're competitors too. So hey, that's okay. Yeah. Do you do you have competitors in your group or is it kind of. Uh, oh, like, totally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, got, not, gotcha. What is a typical uh, member? I mean, is it a, is a fortune 500 company? Is it a uh, solopreneur who works out of his bedroom? I mean, what is, what is your, who belongs to well, C-suite? Yeah, all of the above. We, we target only VPs or higher of companies greater than 2 million. And, and the breakdown is about 21% of our members are from fortune, you know, excuse me, from billion dollar companies. And then we have about 27% or 100 million to a billion. And then 51% of our membership are from companies under 100 million, which is the vast majority of businesses. If you look at, you know, sure. businesses in North America, 28 million businesses in North America, and there's only about 35 or 40,000, you know, over 100 million. So there's not that many that are at that level. 
Right. No, I, the, the, the pyramid gets narrower at the top, but those oh. ones at the top are pretty big, aren't they? They're big. You know, I, I've, I've lucky enough to been in a Fortune 100 company, love, you know, lucky enough to be in the chief marketing officer of Eastman Kodak at one time. Yeah. You know, man, $17 billion budgets and tens of thousands of employees. So, yeah, I know exactly what that's uh, How like. does the left hand know what the right hand is doing when you start talking about strategy and marketing strategy and something that size? Well, you got to have good values, first of all, and good operating procedures in the company. But mostly it's about the values of having the right kinds of people. And then from that, you start developing great processes and practices, you know, that you can be able to do it. You know, most leaders think they're, you know, really truly become managers. The key is to break out of that management. Which we, you and I were talking about a program today. You got to be more than just a manager. You got to be a leader. So you got to paint a picture where you're going to go and help them get there. Well, I really like that. I, I, I Jeff, Jeffrey is referring to uh, uh, one of his live broadcasts I, I listened to today earlier in the day. And on, on that, the, the, the former NFL quarterback speaker was talking about the difference between leadership and management. And uh, I, I think I learned from that, that uh, broadcast, Jeffrey, that I'm more on the leadership side as far as the visionary taking people, in my case, small, you know, onesie, to the uh, five person companies uh, where they want to go. Their strategy and vision is important to them, but uh, uh, the bottom line is people need leadership. They need to have that direction. It sounds like you provided that at Kodak. Well, yeah, I was the I was brought in, and, and of course my CEO at the time he didn't want me to be a cyberborg. He wanted me to be out there on the edge, you know. Yeah. And, and that's my job. You know, there's people inside the company who are managers, you know, like chief legal officers and chief. HR officers, those typically, they try to pull you back to the center of the stage. And my job was to go to the very edge, you know, yeah. where you almost fall off. That's what we're supposed to do. So, Well, I, I've heard you speak live. I had that opportunity last summer at uh, um, Gina Guzman's uh, event uh, in, in Omaha, Nebraska. And I, I got a kick out of the uh, um, uh, story you told about um, digital photography was invented by Kodak, but uh, that's all. Yeah, you have a short right. version of that we can share with my well, viewers. We, yeah, we invented it, and then of course we pawned it off on Apple with all the grace of an anaconda eating a rabbit. I mean, we, <laughs> we had a lot of muscle back then, and of course, uh, a number of lawsuits later. But you know, yeah, we invented a lot of different things. But just because you invent them doesn't mean you can market them and take them to market and have a good go to market. So we made some dis mistakes because we really believed in our hubris of success, and so. We yeah. thought that everything we made was film and, you know, film wasn't that. We weren't ever in the film business. We were in the make, manage and move images and information business. We were right. in the emotional technology business. Right. And that would have applied to digital. We just forgot what business we were in. Yeah. I mean, you did. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's tough. I mean, especially when they were the first big, the big player, I suppose. And uh, they, they invented the industry kind of, and then it's hard not to rest on your laurels. Yeah. Well, George Eastman, you know, many years back uh, before he passed, he said, I want to make photography as easy as owning a pencil. You yeah. know, and so, and that was a very, very ingenious way of being able to say it. And, you know, if everybody has a pencil, I want to have everybody have a camera. Well, back then they didn't. So, you know, he invented this very inexpensive brownie and, yeah. and he gave him away to, you know, all these kids that were born on this year. So he could, invent the market and and wow. reinforce them it was absolutely brilliant no different than than apple did a number of years ago going right. to schools remember they went to schools and they concentrated on schools and what do they do right. they grew one of the biggest markets in the world oh, yeah. and, and of course you know microsoft back then was saying what a stupid move we're, yeah, yeah. we're going after all these businesses well sure. apple grew a decades of customers my show is focused on the on the small business side and um this Small business administration tells me a small business is every, anything under uh, $50 million. And I go, well, that's, that's pretty big compared to some of the people I work with. But uh, <laughs> they, they'd like to be in there, but and, and 50 or 100 people. And so small business is a nebulous term, I guess. So anyway, uh, when I talk to the small businesses, work with them on coaching and video and things like that, uh, they, they often ask, you know, well, how can I stand out? I mean, that's where we... That's what we work on uh, with them is making sure they stand out from the crowd. Let me ask you, I mean, what makes you, I mean, there's a lot of speakers out there. If I put professional, motivational, or sales speaker, or marketing speaker, I, I get a lot. I mean, what makes Jeffrey Hazett 
different than the rest of the crowd who does, does somewhat what you do. Well, I think the same thing that would apply to a small business, and that is you, you want to be right. authentic. You want to be true to the brand. You know, a brand is nothing but a promise delivered. So what right. is that promise that you're delivering? So that's what I do is I stand out and say, hey, this is what we're going to deliver in terms of an experience as a speaker, you know, or as a C-suite network member, or uh, if I'm selling you this pen, you know, this is what we're going to be able to do for you and how we're going to deliver it. And then you want to exceed that. And then, you know, every business wants to take that and use that content to get their word out. And that's really what you have to do today. You can't sit back and do the old things. You can't wait for the old tried and true, you're going to have to start to build more content right. and get that content out there, activate that content. You've got to be a brand. You've got to be your own network. You've got to be your own spokesperson. And that's, that's what's going to take to, in order to be successful in the future. Well, and, and I, I think you take your own advice pretty well because uh, you, you are building a brand. And uh, I think uh, even the, with, with this, the, the whole change in staying home and the virus and all that, uh, has affected you. you uh, you're getting your brand out there more than ever, I think. I've done more now during COVID than I've ever done in my life in terms of speaking <laughs> programs, events, and quite frankly, business. I mean, um, in crisis, there are, you know, opportunities. And I'm, that doesn't mean to say that other people haven't lo lost or they will lose or, and I right. feel absolutely just terrible, but we have to change. You have to, you use the P word, the pivot word. I, I just say you just have to continually change. And so for us, we didn't pivot. We just adapted very quickly because right now during COVID, I mean, you know, days are weeks, weeks are months, months are years. So what would have taken you years to do, you've got no. to do in months. Uh, what would have taken you weeks, you got to do in days. And what no. takes you days, you got to do in minutes. I mean, literally, it's like that. Well, yeah, and and and, um, and that ties in with what I lo I love what you just said about that brand equals promise delivered. I mean, we hear so much about brand. You got to brand yourself, and you got to you know. And what what is that? Is mark is that marketing? Is that sales? Is that is mark brand execution of sales? What is brand brand brand? And I you know, I almost get tired of the phrase, but I love how simple you boiled that down. Give well, people, more quite about. frankly, people, people have changed it. I mean, because the brand is something that we've always used here in the Midwest. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's this identification on the side of a bovine. It's something we always put on a cow <laughs> and occasionally a horse. I mean, that's I what we've him. done. And then that got adapted and changed into a company and then a logo. And now people say, well, here's my brand. I'm working on my brand. Well, if you're working on your brand, you should be working on your promise to the customer to your right. client. What is it that's the essence of what you are? The colors, the look, the feel, all that stuff are attributes to your brand, not the brand itself. A brand is at its core what the customer thinks it is, and that's the brand. You might be a shepherd of it. You don't own it. Right. You're a shepherd of that brand. The customer owns the brand because, in <laughs> essence, they're the one that tells you what you stand for and who you really are. That's a, that's a great outlook on it. And I love it starting with the, I think that was the first branding was putting your, your farm's uh, logo on, sure. on a, a cow or a, a yeah. Now I get started. Yeah. Well, and you know, I mean, and I, you made me think about it even more the whole idea of those were logos. You had to have your own unique logo to separate your brand of your cattle from someone else. Yeah, the slash bar, the, yeah. the you know, the double loop or whatever, sure. you know, there, yeah, there's some great ones. The lazy J, the lazy W, lazy S. Oh, yeah. lazy. That's terrific. <laughs> and and it, it translates in today. Uh, how, how do you say I mean, a branding story I just experienced. I was, went to the grocery store and uh, guess what? We needed some, um, some laundry detergent. And we uh, typically just uh, knee jerk reaction for years by tide. Why? Well, you know, I mean, is, is it better than everybody else? Is it cheaper than anybody else? Oh, it's just kind of the knee-jerk default. So I'm looking at that and say, well, why do we do that? And I look at the brands next to it and, and the prices. Some of them are priced a little better. But most of them all have about the same promise. But guess what? I, there's a there's a comfort. You talk. You, you hit it on the head, Jeffrey. When I you talk about brand as the promise delivered, I grab that orange jug. And uh, it, it's the one with the Febreze or whatever. I can't remember. Oh, wow. You, <laughs> hey, you went fancy on us if you got the Febreze one. Oh, That's yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm doing pretty good financially. I can handle the Febreze. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I uh, went, went just did that habit thing, but thought more about it. And you come home and you put it in the 
uh, I almost said dishwasher, no, <laughs> put it in the washing machine and, uh, and, and you have that odor and the smell and the, the consistency of the pour. And it's just, it's a promise delivered. It's very comfortable, right. very satisfying. I mean, do you have help some of your big clients with things like that? Oh, all the time. We have a consulting practice called Tallgrass, which is our C-suite marketing services and public relations and social service. We do that all the time. So we help them formulate exactly who they need to be, what they want to do and how. So what's the essence? And we have to sit down and really spend some time of what the essence of what we're doing and how we're doing it. You know, you, you, you know like we worked early on with a company like DocuSign. Well, DocuSign was oh. an e-signature company. Well, no, you're not. You're a document transactional management company. You do more than that. Yeah. You do more than just e-signature. You help people buy houses. Right. Uh, you yeah. do contracts. You help manage a system of how people are in the ecosystem of doing the signature itself. So it's a lot broader than that. And you can spend, and of course it adds more value when you really get it down to the core of who you are. Right. It sounds like you really help people figure out what business they're in. I mean, that's not a signature. It's me living in a new home and enjoying the benefits of all that, isn't it? Yeah. Well, and you want to make sure that, well, if there ever is a legal challenge and is that valid, you know, (laughs) but you want to make it convenient, you know, I, I had somebody send me a document just the other day and I, I had to print it out, sign it, scan it, send it back. Put it in the mail. You know, like, what? Are you kidding me? Why can't I just do an e-signature? Why can't I do this? And it was like, I, I first of all, I had to go find a printer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, things things change. And so, yeah, they got to stay, stay up ahead. Hey, um, I... Uh, we, 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 uh, we've missed the big story here. The reason I have people like you on is uh, I want to hear your story. I mean, how did you get started in all this? I mean, yeah, you rolled from uh, the CMO role at Kodak, a Fortune 100 company. Uh, what was next? How did you get started in the consulting, the speaking? I mean, what, what well, advice got, do you have for my, my lit viewers who would ever want to do something like that? Well, I got, you know, I got started a long time ago. I'm, in, I'm from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, just up the road from you. And right. uh, just a, a very small community. I got more people in the stands, the Indianapolis 500, the day of the race than our entire state of South Dakota. You know, during this COVID stuff, we've been practicing. So everybody's talking about practicing social distancing. We've been doing that since 1889. So you know, that's where I'm from. The whole state, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, I bought and sold over 250 businesses in my career, about $25 billion in transaction. And, wow. Um, I started in Sioux Falls and started with just, a, you know, working in politics, you know, in the House and Senate, worked for George McGovern, worked for Tom Daschle, and then wow. I went out and started my own public relations company and then built that up, bought a printing company, bought another company, bought another company, and then decided that, hey, whatever I was doing in South Dakota, I could do everywhere in the world. Sure, why not? So I could do this in Iowa. I can do this in Nebraska. I can or do New this York in, City. Yeah, or New York City, or eventually yeah. Paris, London, wow. you know, China, India, Australia. And so I went around the world doing that. And, you know, and I started doing speeches and doing some of that. But in between those gigs, I was always buying and selling companies and very involved with diff- different industries as I learned. Sure. And sure. then, you know, would, would do this gig and then learn this company and like, well, geez, maybe I should buy it. And then maybe I should roll up a hundred of them. Well, let's and, back way up. I mean, what, when did you realize you had that kind of an entrepreneurial bug? I mean, you did not want to go work uh, for some big employer necessarily. You wanted to, well, I think maybe your politics uh, work probably is. Yeah, kind of but no, but, we, but way before that, back when I was running my own uh, lawn mowing cut, cutting business when I was 10 and uh, wow, selling okay. magazines and selling tickets to the barbecue, the baseball barbecues. I was always good at that stuff. So I knew early on that, you know, man, I really like this. I love selling. I love marketing. I love, sure. you know, promoting things, uh, campaigns as I was doing, you know, when I was 10, sure. 11, 12, 14. That's you know, I saw that. somebody campaigning for Congress, had one of those cool straw hats. I said, I want one of those. How do I get one? They said, go pass out all these flyers. And they gave me one. Uh, that's where they, they had me hooked, you know. There so, you go. Yeah. so selling things have always been kind of come natural for me. And then, and I love storytelling and I used to sit down and, um, back when I was in my early 20s, got to meet people like Zig Ziglar and Bill Brooks and Brian Tracy and Og oh, yeah. Mandino and some of the greatest speakers in the world, uh, sure. uh, Jenny Robinson and so many others that are wow. part of the Hall of Fame, speaking Hall of Fame, which I was eventually inducted into. So I was great to be able to be at the, you know, be at the knees of those speakers wow. um, yeah. many, many decades ago. 
That's the death threats for sure. Yeah, well, uh, it's time for a last question, I guess. Uh, I wish we could talk all day here, but uh, um, you know, a lot of people with the with the the virus and the pandemic and such are are in transitions themselves, and I mean, they they may not be able to go back to a job, and and, and they may want to start on being entrepreneurial. I mean, what what kind of one piece of advice do you have for someone who does want to? I mean, maybe they didn't start mowing lawns when they were ten years old, but uh, I mean, but the, what, where, well, where should time, they start? Where should they go from well, the, from here? Best time to plant a tree was forty years ago. Best time to plant one now is right now. So that's what you want to think. There's lots of side hacks, lots of ways to do it. Listen, folks, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I can't even sew a mask. But what I can do is help people. So I'm a business first responder. Come be a business first responder with me. This country needs people to help them get back on their feet and get them where they need to go. So. Think back during the last recession, 2008, one of the darkest times in American business. Right. What were some of the great companies that were formed? Uber, Airbnb. Look at them today, and I can go on and give you a whole wow. list of companies that were formed during the depression, recessions, and downturns that are some of the biggest brands in the world today. And That's it all started terrific. with an idea. You That's know, terrific. all started with an idea. You know, Uber was started by a couple of guys who were in France attending a conference. And at two o'clock in the morning, they were, had been out and they had a, a few pops and they, uh, it was past midnight. If you've ever been to Paris, if you ever get a chance to go, you'll know that at midnight, the cab drivers stop. Oh. They're done. They're going. They go home. These guys couldn't speak French. So they had to walk and cross the entire city because they couldn't get a cab, okay? Might have been later than two in the morning. Might have been three or four, okay? They were having a great time. Hey, listen, they were on vacation. But they couldn't get home. They walked. And while they walked home, they said, you know what we need? We need an app that we could call a cab or call a car. And that's how it was strong during the darkest time, one of the darkest sure. times in business. So you can, if they, and but trust me, I know those guys. They're not that smart. So if they can do it, <laughs> you can do it. And it's just that easy. That's terrific. That's terrific. Well, uh, Jeffrey, it's been a pleasure uh, chatting with you. Time flies just way too fast when we do this. Um, where do people learn more about you and C-Suite? And, uh, hey, my email's your- right there, right there on the screen, Jeff at, at C-Suite. I should have put at c-suitenetwork.com. So yeah. it's at c-suitenetwork.com. By all means, look me up, Hazlet, H-A-Y-Z-L-E-T-T, or check out anything C-Suite. You can find us. And we put it all on the screenshots at the end of the show as well and at the beginning and, and all through the show as well. So, hey, Jeffrey, it's been my pleasure to have you along. Uh, thanks so much for the time and the wisdom. Uh, you have a very unique perspective out there. My viewers will appreciate it. And hope, I hope they go back and uh, rewind and, and get some of the golden nuggets that you put out there. So, Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining us. And um, folks, we'll see you next week on the Grow Your Biz show. 